Welcome this evening to our question and answer. I've, I've heard that um, uh, some people have not had their questions answered, and so I'm not supposed to do the emailed in ones. So if you want to come to the microphones, uh, anybody that has your questions, oh, look, and, and age before beauty at that mic. Okay, Phil. And, uh, oh, only two questions tonight. We will get to Nepal quickly. Uh, so thank you, Phil, very much. Okay, Phil Stick. Hello, my name is? Hi, my name is Phil Stickney. I was reading in Isaiah 60 about uh, the sacrifice during the thousand-year reign of Christ, and I was talking to Terry Rowland, and he gave me some good direction, but he sent me over to Ezekiel 40, chapters 40 through 48, in the, in the thousand-year reign of Christ. And it sounds to me that there will be animal sacrifice at that time. If there isn't animal sacrifice, what type of sacrifice will there be? And in the Old Testament, the sacrifice, we would always look forward to the cross of Christ. And in the thousand year reign, are we going to look back to the cross of Christ? And since redemption has been completed through Christ, what is the purpose of the animal sacrifice? Wow, Phil. I think that's about six questions, okay? Um, the last one is, what's the purpose? Um, and I'll answer that real quickly. I decided what I'll do is uh, I'll just answer this uh, like I would in a hallway between services. And uh, So, Phil, yes, yes, th there are animal sacrifices because there wasn't anything wrong with animal sacrifices. Uh, in the Old Testament, and, and they were all portraying the coming sacrifice of Christ. No one at any time in history was saved by any animal sacrifice. They were always saved by faith and a faithful response to what God asked for. And he asked them to, and if you've read, that's why even though for a lot of people it's hard to read Leviticus, it's beautiful to read Leviticus. The father brought the, the sacrificial lamb for the family, the family watched him. He brought it to the priest. The priest looked it over to make sure it was unblemished and kosher, you know, proper f according to the standards of God. The dad put his hands on it, signifying that he was confessing on behalf of the family all of their inability to save themselves, and the guilt for their sins was on that animal, which was innocent and spotless and not guilty of anything. And that animal was slain in their place, and it was much like... Uh, this, I could, this is sin. Now watch. If I do this long enough, you can't see the sin. That's what every animal sacrifice did. It just covered, and th that word uh, for covering, kafar, the, the Hebrew kafar, which by the way is the same word that's used in the ark for the pitch, it covered. But is the sin still there? It is. And so what all of the Old Testament sacrifices did is all of the animal sacrifices looked forward to the cross. And to answer Phil's question, all of those passages and a whole lot more he didn't mention are when God fulfills all of his promises that he's made that have never been fulfilled yet for Israel. And part of them will be that during the millennial time, which is mentioned six times in Revelation 20, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, and a thousand. That means there's a thousand somethings coming. And it, most likely it's a year, and that's what millennium comes from. But in the millennium, in the millennial temple, which is what this describes, all of the sacrifices look back at the cross. Just like no one was saved by an animal sacrifice, they were just saying, yes, I need a substitute who will someday die in my place, and this animal sacrifice covers, but doesn't take it away. The, the word for taking away is the expiation, uh, the, the actual removal that, that Jesus Christ it, it was covered, uh, it was, it was uh, the condemnation was taken away, 
but it was still there until the cross, and then the cross doesn't cover. It forever removes, and it is once and for all gone. And so that's why in the Millennial Temple they'll say, None of these sacrifices are anything but a picture looking back because Jesus said we only have communion until he what? Comes. The millennial temple is after Christ returns. So that's the whole understanding of it. He has come back. There's no more celebration of communion because he has returned. And so he goes back because the millennial temple is evangelistic. It's pointing people to the cross and many the majority of people in the millennium are lost unsaved how we know that Genesis 20 God burns them all up because they rebel even after a thousand years of having Jesus Christ portrayed in the temple him actually being here ruling with a rod of iron and they still reject so Phil I would love to go and I can draw many pictures and explain it, but I personally believe that unless you want to spiritualize uh, some very, very uh, clear teaching that there is a temple right down to the measurements, they do do animal sacrifices and they do a lot of other stuff too. They have a priesthood, the priesthood follows Leviticus's qualifications, uh, they also have feasts. And you know what God says in Isaiah? He says, if you won't come to my temple in the millennium, I won't reign on your field. Wow. It'd be like living in West Texas, you know, today, and nothing would grow. So God is trying to get everybody to come through, see the picture of the cross, bow in faith, evangelistic, and the purpose is always the same. Sacrifice is pointed to Christ, and the ones in the future will point back at Christ. Is that good enough? You're a blessing. Okay, I'm ready. Hello, I'm? Hi, I'm John. My question John is, whom? John Grief. I knew that. I want all of them to know. We need to practice names. Okay, John. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew midwives would lie to the Egyptians to protect the newborn males. And God rewarded them for that. So where does the means justify the ends? That's a good question. You didn't tell me you were going to ask that one. He usually tips me off. Okay. Um, midwives lie. Uh, he said the ends justify means. Uh, what it's called in theology uh, is called situational ethics. Uh, or if any of you are from Roman Catholic background, Jesuit casuistry. The, the idea that, uh, that you, for the sake of good, can lie. So let's first look at what he's talking about. Look in Exodus. Um, since we only have two questions, I have to go a long time on this one. Where are all these people moaning that I never answer their questions? I don't even see them. Uh, I'm teasing. Okay. Uh, they're, they're uh, let's see, the, the midwives, chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 19, and backing up um, in verse 11, the taskmasters, verse 12, they're more afflicted, they're growing, verse 14, their lives are bitter, and then um, verse 16, uh, he, Pharaoh actually says, if it's a son, kill him. If it's a daughter, she shall live. But, verse 17, the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but saved the male children alive. And then the king of Egypt called for the midwives, verse 18 of Exodus 1, and said, why have you done this? And saved the male children. And the midwives said, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they are lively, they give birth before the midwives come. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mightily. And so it was because the midwives feared God, he provided households for them. By the way, where, where did it say that they lied? Where, which verse does it say? 
Let's see. Does it actually say they lied, John? Or have you heard that all your life? Well, actually, I mean, it's implied, and, and I've always heard all my life that they lied, but it really doesn't, it, it doesn't, in these verses, say that they lied. Uh, they just said that the, the, Hebrew mid, the Hebrew women give birth before we get there. Now, basically, there are many views. Okay, number one, if they lied, why did God bless them? I'll answer that first. God did not bless them for lying. God blessed them for fearing him and for not murdering children. And, and you can, in the, in the literature on this, it's possible that instead of lying, that the midwives tipped them off and said, we're coming, uh, <laughs> and if the baby is born, when I'm there, the Pharaoh wants him killed, and so if they're born, I can't wrestle them out of your arms and throw them into the Nile River and drown them. So it could be that they tipped them off. But if they did lie, uh, does God honor lying? No. God is immutable. So, number one, lying is always sin. Always sin. God does not, is not a situational ethicist. Um, you know, the Jesuit priests, um, they're the kind of the uh, special forces of the Pope. They are known for their casuistic, uh, it's kind of like the same thing we see in Islam. It says, actually, in the Quran that if you're being defeated, then, then call for a little truce so that you can rearm and kill them, you know, go back and win. And it's this idea that you, that you do whatever it takes to accomplish your goal. That is not what God says. The ends do not justify the means. You don't change your ethics by situations. Jesuistic lying is wrong. And if the midwives lied, uh, and in the New Testament's comments on, on this whole period of time is where this notion comes from. So let's talk about um, if they lied, they sinned, even though what's interesting is the Ten Commandments about not lying are not written for quite a while after this, about, you know, uh, 80 years later that we have the whole giving of the Ten Commandments. So they're not... There is not a commandment that is written down by God that says don't lie. That comes in chapter 20. But it's still a moral that their conscience would have convicted them on. And so probably one thing is they were so convicted they felt that murder was worse than lying and so they lied so they didn't have to murder. The second thing is that they were deceptive and they tipped off the, the mothers to, you know, you know, have the baby yourself so it'll survive. Um, and that brings us to this whole situational ethics. My personal, uh, I'll give an anecdotal uh, before I comment on it. Uh, when I traveled behind the Iron Curtain in the 70s and smuggled Bibles, um, I guess if you smuggle, that means that you're hiding something. And so we believed that that because the communist officials said that it was wrong for people to have Bibles, that it was okay for us to take them Bibles against the law, but we, our mission, we said we would never lie. Now, there were, when I was doing this from uh, 1977 through 1979, uh, during that time period, there were 40 missions that were delivering Bibles into Eastern Europe. And as far as I know, because I was at a conference with all of them gathered, only two of them had this philosophy. No lying. All the rest of the missions had training for the college students how to look a Soviet guard in the eye and not flinch and lie to them. And you practiced. They come up and say, do you have Bibles? You go, no, I Bibles? Are you kidding? Sound like Peter in, you know, in Caiaphas' courtyard and you cuss and swear and kick a little bit and say, are you kidding? I don't, you know, nothing to do with Bibles, even though you had a carload of them. And they actually trained them in that. I thought, 
Well, what happens when you get back home and you don't like the government and you don't want to pay taxes? Did you earn money? Are you kidding? I don't earn any money. I'm not going to pay tax on that. I mean, when do you stop all this? I mean, you can, you can have your situational ethics, you can have a different ethic for a different situation, and you can become very hardened by that. In fact, it, it's deceptive. It's, it's, uh, you can learn to deceive people, to make them think what you want them to think. And the turning point for me was uh, our largest trip, I mean, I had already decided I wasn't going to lie, but I hadn't really thought about it as deeply until we got to northern Africa. And in Morocco, in that time period, they had tanneries where they had no mechanization. Humans tanned animal hides. If you know anything about tanning, it's, it's successions of baths of alkaline, very strong um, agents that you would put this plywood piece of camel hide that was stiff as a board into it, and the men would jump up and down on these hard skins until they softened up, and then they'd throw them over the wall into the next pool where others were doing something else, jumping up and down on them. They'd throw them over the wall into the next pool. These were human agitators. They were in this, this strong solution that was tanning leather hides. They were instead of having any machinery in Morocco, they had people. And these, these guys just wore these little shorts, no shirt, no pants, and they were just all day long kind of doing water aerobics. Well, we took a tour of the tannery. And one of those men, can you imagine doing water aerobics all day, the muscles you'd have in your legs? And one of the men was standing there while we were eating couscous, which is the local Moroccan food. And he was standing by me, and I said, uh, excuse me, I said, could you ask him, I have a question, can I touch your, your leg? Because I wanted to see what the skin was like for someone that spent their lifetime in an agent that softened hard board-like leather and softened it because it was such strong chemicals. I wanted to see what the softener did to his soft skin. And the skin of those leather people was like naga hide, or uh, you can think of anything you want. It was, it was plastic. It, was, it had changed their skin into hardness. I don't know their life expectancy, but what I thought about is a person who is deceptive, they are, through their, you know, willing to say whatever uh, needs to happen, they're trying to soften the blow of if they were caught by their deception. But just like in the leather factory, the softening agent hardened them. What I've seen is people that learn to not tell the truth in one setting. I had a student when I was high school, youth pastor, kind of like um, Jordan or, or uh, Justin and Jeremy are, and Jordan was, whose father worked for the CIA. And this boy grew up. Every time they answered the phone, they never said whose residence it was. They just said, hello. And the person would say, I want Mr. Smith. And they'd say, just a minute. And they'd hand the phone to their dad. And their dad was Mr. Smith. The next day, they'd answer the phone. They'd say, I want Mr. Miller. And Mr. Miller was the next day. This boy grew up with a father that he never knew who he was. And the mother never knew where he was. And, and he never, because he was a spy, he never told anybody anything that was tr exactly what was going on. And when that boy was in my youth group, he says, and you know what? He said, my dad didn't keep his word with us. He had a woman in every port, you know. And I know not all CIA agents are like that, but what I say is be careful of, of deception. So back to John. See, now I just, that was a rabbit trail. Did they lie? In Exodus, it doesn't say they lied. In the New Testament, it infers uh, that, that there was something going on that, that was happening in this time that has been this classic, they lied. Why did God bless them? Number one, the reason that the commentators would say is that, that there, there was not yet the written law. Number two, they were in a pagan society and did not have the, you know, Judeo, as it is, uh, ethics there. And number three, because life was more important than, you know, the truthfulness. So the lie 
was a lesser evil than this. And this is why, for example, Corrie ten Boom and you know, all of that about hiding the Jews and everything else. Now back to us. So we had to, smuggling Bibles, had to go through the same communist borders. And what our mission said is, if you tell the truth and you get caught, then you go to jail. And that's the price you pay to be on our mission. All the other students wanted the excitement of going on the mission, but they didn't want to ruin their fall college, so they lied so they wouldn't get caught so they could go back to school in September. But what they told us was that if you're on this mission and the Lord called you, that you shouldn't lie, and if he wants you to get through the border, they'll never ask you. And so our team actually took over 50,000, probably more like 150,000 Bibles in, and no one ever asked us once. And we took them in the Muslim countries. We took them by the trailer load. We took travel trailers behind us, stacked to the ceilings. And we watched the Lord do the most amazing things. We would drive in. You ever crossed into a Muslim or a communist country? You wait in line five or six hours at the border. You think Canada's bad or Mexico? Six hours. They take the car. Everyone gets out. They take the mats out. They unbolt the seats. They take everything out of the trunk. They take the liner out of the trunk. Another guy's got a, a long metal thing. He's fishing in the gas tank to see if you've got anything floating in there. Hood's up. A guy is on one of those roller things, you know, that you lay on and go underneath the car, and he's clunking and, and tapping under there, looking to see if there's a, a false bottom on the car. Other people are walking around the car going, looking for hollow places. And you sit in your car for six hours and you edge forward car by car. And when they find something, you see them drag the people off. So it's quite an exciting, dramatic thing to sit there and have people behind you and knowing your turn is coming. And we did that month after month. And every time we got up, the people would get in our car and they'd start talking to us and ask us about America or whatever. And they wouldn't thump anything. They never took the mats out. Or other times, it was the changing of the guard. And, you know, no one wants to work overtime because everyone got paid the same in a communist country, so why would you want to work overtime and not get double in time and a half? And so it would just work out. The Lord would time. What I'm saying is the Lord always honored the no-lie teams. We never had one team ever caught. And we, run, we would run like this. But the lie teams... They were imprisoned in Bratislava, they were imprisoned in Bruno, they were imprisoned in whatever, because they would say, I don't have anything, and they'd thump their car, and they'd say, well, what, what is that? And then they would bring out their sawzall, and they'd go, Vroom! and, oh, how did those get in there, you know? Bibles, I don't believe in Bibles, you know? It, so it's just interesting to me, that's anecdotal, there's no verse and reference for it, but I will say, I saw the Lord honoring because i do live after i know you know the thou shalt not bear false witness i know that god is a god of truth and i know that if he called me that i don't have to lie for him that he would find another way and to make a long story short i even remember once that uh i was trying to get out of the car that was going into a muslim country and we had six thousand bibles for transworld radio hand addressed with every Muslim that ever had responded to Christian radio. Their name and address was written on a paper cover of a Bible ready to mail. That was the most important trip we ever took, 6,000 of them. If they'd have caught us, they would have had the name and address of everyone in all 20, however Muslim nations there are, that had listened to Transfer Radio. And I watched them take all the cars apart in front of us. We had a trailer filled with 6,000 Bibles. I drove up, I was the driver, and and I had the passports in my hand, and I was opening the door, and I couldn't get it open. I kept going like this. You know how in Michigan it rusts, you know, and I was used to that, and I was pushing on it, and I looked down, and the Muslim guard, the Moroccan guard, had his knee against my door. And we were going back and forth, him pushing, me pushing, and he was looking at the clock, like I am right now, hoping to run it out so we don't have any more hard questions. And he was watching for quitting time, and as soon as it went... He, he pushed the passports back in and he said, go, go. 
And we roared through that border with our trailer and our 6,000 Bibles and all of the sweaty college students that were ready to go to Muslim jail. And we said, God is able to do exceedingly, I mean, what we thought we were planning to go to jail. And what the Lord wanted to show us is that in that circumstance, his will for us was that we not get caught. And, uh, and he did many other incredible things. So John, uh, the short answer is the Lord didn't bless them for lying. If they deceived, he blessed them for preserving life. But God never blesses sin. God forgives sins. He doesn't bless us for disobeying his moral law and his revealed will. But he does overlook. And, and I mean, those women, the Lord blessed them for preserving the life of those uh, male Hebrew children. And beware of anybody that teaches that you can have one ethic in one place and another ethic in another because what it will do to you is what it did to the Moroccan leather workers. It, it, it makes you calloused to the truth. And as you're listening to someone, you decide how much truth you're going to tell them. And then you can't remember the last lie, so you have to tell another lie to cover the last lie. And it becomes like the drama we see in our political system nowadays. So, any other questions? I could talk about, oh, oh wow, Jesse and, and sweet little one. Um, Got to say your name. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am. Once Jesus comes down, does God make another earth and have it be perfect? Say, read it again, please, because I wasn't close enough to this thing. I couldn't hear you. When Jesus comes down, mm -hmm. does God make another earth and have it be perfect? Yes, he does, but not for a thousand years. But, yes, he does, and let me show you how, okay? And then, Jesse, we'll have yours. Uh, look, look at chapter 19 of Revelation, everyone. And this is fascinating. John saw, and, and you tie together uh, two passages. Revelation 19 is what, what Miss Julian just said, Jesus coming down. So Jesus returns. Uh, that's chapter 19. Let me get there. And notice what it says. He he actually uh, comes flying in on this horse. Verse 11, the heavens open. White horse, Jesus on there. Verse 12, eyes like a flame of fire, robe dipped in blood. And he comes, and in verse 17, it says, come to the supper, and he wipes out all the armies. This is Armageddon. Wipes out all the armies. And look in verse 20. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire. So the beast and the false prophet are cast in a lake of fire. Now look what's exactly next. This is Phil Stickney. This is the 1,000 years. Um, which, notice it says in verse 2, 1,000 years. In verse 3, 1,000 years. In verse 4, 1,000 years. In verse 5, 1,000 years. In verse 6, 1,000 years. And in verse 7, 1,000 years. And so there's that interlude of a thousand years through uh, verse 7. And then look at verse 7 of chapter 20. Then the devil, see this thousand years is the period of time that Satan is imprisoned. He is, he's neutralized in his ability to influence the nations. And the Lord, all those millennial promises that are in the Old Testament are, are allowed but after verse 7, he's released and this Phil's temple that we were talking about and all that stuff hasn't affected everybody. Look what it says in verse 8. He deceives the nations which are in the four corners, gathers them together to battle. Their numbers are like the sand of the sea. They go up the breadth of the earth, verse 9. They come to the camp of saints in the beloved city. That's Jerusalem where this gigantic temple is. And... Uh, it, it, this uh, fire, verse 9, comes down from God of heaven, devours them, and the devil, so he's only released briefly, he organizes the whole world to go against God, and the devil, and, and 
is cast in the lake of fire, verse 10, where the beast and the false prophet are. And you notice that they're still alive after a thousand years. So that means there's no annihilation in hell. Now look to answer your question, verse 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And, and what you interleave before you get to Revelation 21, which is new heaven and earth, new heaven and new earth, what you find between these two is what Peter says in 2 Peter 3. And what he says there is that the heavens pass away. So this is when it happens. It happens right between the end of 20 and the beginning of 21. And it says in 2 Peter 3 that the heavens pass away with a fervent heat. Verse 10 I'm reading. Uh, day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, and the heavens pass away with a great noise, and the elements melt with a fervent heat. The earth and the works in it will be burned up, and since all these things will be dissolved, so the Lord dissolves everything uh, from 10 onward, and then makes it new, a new heaven and a new earth. And that takes us to Revelation 21, which is classic, what people call heaven. And it's the holy city, New Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven, and, and it, it seems like heaven and earth merge. This heavenly city, this cube, 1,200-mile uh, cube, comes down and, and, uh, and provides this merging of heaven and earth, and you can read all the heaven things. So, yes, he makes everything new, and basically what I'd say is, in Greek, there's two news. If I say... I'm getting a new pair of shoes like these. These are maroon colored shoes and they have tassels. So I would get new of the same kind. There's also new that I want something new and I get blue fluorescent ones. That's new of a different kind. This is new of the same kind. So what that means is, and that's what we were talking about two weeks ago on Sunday night, that in heaven, Everything wonderful on earth will be perfected because it's new like we have now. So that means water will be blue, grass will be green, but there won't be weeds, there won't be thistles, there won't be poisonous snakes and spiders, and we won't sleep, and we won't get old, and we won't get tired, and people won't be, we'll have new hearts. And, but it's new heavens, that means stars and galaxies, but they're not, blowing up and wearing down. And new earth, there'll be water and not, not seas of separation, but there'll be all of the beauty of creation. But it'll be the way God designed it to be. And uh, that is such a good question. Where's Miss Julian? So did, where'd she go? Is that enough? You want to know any more? Okay, thank you. Okay, Jesse, you still impress me the way you played the piano with the bells to, on oh, Easter you. Sunday. My name is Jesse Olson. My daughter and I were talking when we went from church this morning about the devil and his demons and his ability or lack thereof to influence our thoughts, to read our thoughts. And I told her I didn't believe that he can read our thoughts, but that I did think that he could influence them or plant ideas in our minds. But I couldn't think of any biblical verses to back up either of those statements. So I was wondering if you could speak to whether they're correct or not and the biblical basis for that. Oh, Jesse, thank you. Well, l let's look at, at the, the reading minds. Um, Jesus in uh, the Gospels, let me find uh, in Mark, whoever finds it first, let's see, Mark, where he knew, see, I never know what you guys are going to ask, but Jesus knew what they were thinking, let's see, he could read their minds, let me find, while, while you're looking, whoever, one of you that has uh, your concordance, Jesus, when they're letting the guy down through the roof, do you remember that? Is that in two? Um, and remember, yeah, but where does it say he knew what they were thinking? Um, oh, verse 8, yeah, thank you, 2-8. The only, only God, it says in the Bible, only God can read thoughts. It never says demons can, but it does say God can. So, for example, in Mark 2-8, 
is an example. And Jesus did this many times because it says he knew what was in their hearts. But what can the devil do? And that's why, actually, what, what we want to know is the extent that he has. So now look at 2 Corinthians, and I'll just show you two. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And this is what we were just covering. What can the devil do with our minds? And, and think about what your mind is. Your mind is the portal, the communication, the link, the modem, whatever you want to call it. It's the connection between the physical and the spiritual. Our mind is. Our mind is not physical. Now, I know it has electronic, you know, uh, uh, charges going on and the synaptic connections conduct electricity and it's chemically produced electricity and all that stuff uh, that, that we know from uh, studying neurology and, and the study of the mind. But what in the non-material part, the part of us that is our spirit, our mind, where we can think and operate, what can the devil do? Look at 2 Corinthians 10. It says in verse 4, so 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. I was just at a friend's house yesterday, and this is underlined in their Bible. So they have been studying, and they found it. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What it's saying is your mind has to be protected or the devil can can captivate our minds he can he can bring us these thoughts that and now let's go to the second one i want to show you in conjunction with that look at what the armaments that we're supposed to wear in ephesians 6 are ephesians 6 and verse 10 onwards so how do we protect our minds and and keep them from the devil, you know, the weapons of our warfare are not physical, they're spiritual, and, and we're supposed to bring every thought, our thoughts into captivity of Christ. How do we do that? It says in Ephesians 6.10, and, and we could, you know, look at many other passages, especially Paul talked about the devil's devices and the devil's uh, schemes and what he did. But how does he plant them in here? And this is what the Bible says in verse 13. Uh, Take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, stand. Uh, therefore, having your, your well, he, he backs up in verse 12 and says, we're struggling against, 612, against flesh and blood, not against that, but against principalities and powers and the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So take the armor, verse 13, stand, Wear all this protective armor. Now keep going to verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Now look at what the devil can do. By which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now that is interesting. What, what Paul is saying is that the wicked one, that's one of the many, Satan has about at least two dozen different titles in the scriptures. Wicked one is one of them. Satan can, here's our mind, our non-material part of us, and the Holy Spirit has indwelt us. So there's our mind, and it says in 2 Corinthians 1, just a little bit away from where Jeremy was this morning, it says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's interesting, that word sealed. Um, and, and the word is used outside of the Bible in, in the Bible times. It's called extra-biblical usages. It was used for something that they were shipping that they sealed, like the amphora. They used to ship wine, but they would seal that wine so that it wouldn't spill on the boat, nothing would pollute it, and, and it, it had a seal. And actually the the, the scriptures go on to say that we have uh, an ara bone, ara bone, that is like an engagement ring that is the seal on top of the sealing the Holy Spirit that we are marked as belonging to the Lord. But here's our mind. This is you and me. We're, we're, this is our mind. The Holy Spirit moves in and he seals us. And that's why the scriptures never say 
that a Christian can be indwelt by Satan. We can't be. He cannot indwell us. So that, or demons. Demons, the, the scriptures never say a demon can inhabit and, and move inside of us. But what they can do is, look what Ephesians 6, or yeah, 616 says. They are able to shoot fiery darts into our minds. Now you say, how do you divide your mind from your soul from your spirit? Well, since you didn't ask, I won't talk about that. But I'm saying that the devil can spiritually plant in us fiery darts of the, of the wicked one. So what do we do? Verse 17 says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's interesting that when it talks about salvation, it, it compares it to a helmet that you put on your head where your mind is. Have you ever thought about that? The helmet of salvation. Salvation is supposed to protect the most vital part. I mean, you get you lose your head, you're done. And, and so what he's saying is salvation protects us. That's the sealing by the Holy Spirit. But if we are not taking the, the uh, shield of faith and, and warding off the attacks with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Satan can, can shoot his fiery darts. And, you know, there are many things we could uh, talk about that. He can put in fears. Because remember, that's why Paul said to Timothy, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. That fear is not from the Lord. Don't resist the devil. That's what Peter said. If you notice onward in the, um, 1 Peter 5, he says, the, the devil seeks to. In fact, look at what happens if we don't wear the armor. Okay? You know, some people don't wear their armor. Look at 1 Peter 5. It says Satan can devour us. Um, Verse 8, 1 Peter 5, 8. What, what an unprotected mind and believer. Uh, 8 and 9, look what it says. Be sober, be vigilant. Sober, nepho. It's the same word about not uh, being drunk. Uh, don't get under the influence of anything. Isn't that interesting? I, I'm, I'm on a board of several uh, missionary organizations four or five, and one of them, they just had a board meeting. They're rewriting some of their, their code for their missionaries. You know what they had to say? They used to say, you can't use any illegal substances. But you can't say that anymore, because now they have synthetic, if you've read anything about this, synthetic marijuana, synthetic drugs. They have all these names. If you read Time Magazine last week. The kids are dying of this stuff, but the FDA can't test it fast enough to declare it illegal, and they just make it under a different formulation. And so now the mission board can't use the word illegal because most of the bad stuff isn't illegal anymore because they're making it so fast you can't even make it illegal. What they said is that, that you can't be under, you have to be sober. And the, the biblical word, by the way, this is the only word that's in all of the Titus 2 categories, older men, older women, younger men, younger women, all of them are supposed to be sober, which means don't allow your mind to be under the influence of anything. Whether you smoke it, snort it, you know, intravenously, or skin pop it, or drink it, or anything, or get a controller and watch it. You can't, and I can't, Allow, I can't surrender my mind to any substance or power or anything else. So it has to be guarded. So number one, be sober. The second one, that word vigilant is the word gregoreo. Not only are we supposed to be unintoxicated, we're supposed to be on guard, looking for any way. Ephesians 4.27 says, don't give any places to the devil. Don't give him a landing spot. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, verse 8 of 1 Peter 5, right here is where I am. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So what, what the scriptures say is, here's a believer, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, 
But if we are not walking by faith, which is the, the walk of faith is obeying. How did, how did Abraham show God he had faith? He did what he said. Whatever God said, Abraham did. And that's how he showed his faith. Abraham believed God and he did what God said. So as long as a believer is having that shield of faith, obedient to God, but what happens when a believer isn't being obedient to the Lord? They're still indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but the devil can start landing and finding places to land in their life and they get fear and they get lust growing in here and they get this, you know, situational ethics, they're lying and now they feel guilty and all this stuff piles up and the net result is what it says in the end of verse 8, Satan devours us. What does a believer look like that's devoured? The Bible describes it two ways. The Holy Spirit first is grieved because we've allowed all these sins to be undealt with. They're, they're unforsaken, they're unconfessed. Then the Holy Spirit becomes quenched. And that's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. And you know what quench means? It means grieve it is actually emotionally, the Holy Spirit is hurt, sorrowing heavy. Quenched means suppressed. Uh, it's like a, a fire extinguisher. You know, when a plane it comes down, they spray it with that white foam so it won't burst into flames. We can just blanket the Spirit's power in our life by allowing the devil to devour us with, with all these fiery darts that that neutralize basically what it does. And so then Christians, and by the way, many Christians are, they appear to be unsaved because the, the Holy Spirit is so covered with foam of sin in their life. Now, does the Lord allow us, and someone else asked that, but that was an internet, or I mean an email question, so I'm not going to answer it, but how long can you go like that? How long will God let you be like that? That's a good question. So, but back to... Um, where we started uh, with, with the whole, um, where did we start on this? Uh, the, how much can the devil do? No, we started with, can he read our mind? How did I get off on that? No, he can't, but he can influence it, okay? And, and it never, in fact, the devil, Paul said in, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians that if Satan would have known what was going to happen, he would have never crucified Christ. He didn't even understand. Talk about not reading mind. He can't even read the Bible and understand it. Satan. And, and it says whom, uh, if, the, if the, the, ho the principalities, the rulers of this world had known, they would have not have crucified Christ if they'd have known that that was God's plan.